Amen. So let's worship, hey? Your glorious, 
comes the Holy Spirit. I've got an oldie here for you. I think you may remember it.
Yes, Lord, we surrender all to you. We surrender everything to you, Lord. So I woke up this morning and looked at the stars. Just amazing. I don't know there's some atmospheric thing happening, but the sky is so clear at the moment. A couple of days ago, I got up at 2.30 in the morning. I like doing that, just going outside, looking at the stars. You know, it puts everything in perspective. Because I look at the stars and the planets and the, the Milky Way and the constellations, and it just reflects God's creation, God's immenseness <laughs> and His power. And I think, God, yeah, you love me more than these stars. You love me. You sent your son for me, not for any of these stars and constellations. It kind of puts everything in perspective. My God is so loving, so powerful, so great. My Father, my Heavenly Father is so amazing. Creation shouts His glory. Creation screams the, magnus, the majesty of the Creator.
glory. All glory, honor, power is your Amen. Thank you, Andrew and worship team. And uh, good morning and happy new year to everyone here, everyone online, everyone outside. So glad you made it today. Um, we're going to start the year off in the best way I can imagine, and that's taking communion. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ um, and did not pick up one of these on the way in, they're at each door. If you're outside, we've got a station set up or several stations set up where you can grab one. What we're doing is starting off this new year making a, a declaration of faith in who Jesus is and of who we are because of who Jesus is and what he did. Communion for us is about making this declaration of faith that we are children of God, we are forgiven, we are loved, we are accepted by God because of Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross, not because of how we've lived not because of the fact that we're doing it better this year than we did last year. It's all about what he did for us. So if you'd stand up together with me, let's make this declaration before God as we, we take the bread or the wafer and the juice and we look at what Jesus did on the cross and why this is something we declare regularly. What he did was he obediently went to the cross and died, allowed himself to be nailed to a cross as a sacrifice, a sacrifice that would pay for the penalty, the punishment that we would otherwise have as a consequence of our sin. He paid for all of it. He paid for every single one. He paid for each one, no matter how big it was, on the cross. And because of that, we remind ourselves that we are forgiven. We are loved, we are accepted, we've got a place of security now and for the eternity to come. And God wants us to relate to him now as father, as a father who, who loves us. Again, for some you're going, yeah, 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 I know that, fine, but we forget it. We forget it way too often and we forget it at exactly the worst times. And so we take this as a declaration asking the Holy Spirit to bring it back up for us at the right times. If you would, Let's take out of the top this, this wafer. And Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, 
he's bread and broke it and said it represents his body, body broken for us, the body given for us on the cross, a body that endured pain, suffering for us on the cross. Let's take this together. Jesus also took the cup after supper, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and he said that the cup, which what we have in our hand represents, the cup of wine represented his blood, which is what seals the new covenant with God, a covenant by which God has promised to love, accept, and forgive us as we place faith in what Jesus did. Jesus did it, we believe it, and God has promises that then flow from it. You're forgiven if you've received Jesus as Savior. You're accepted and you're loved. Let's take it together. Father God, we thank you for, the, for your amazing love, for this plan of salvation called the gospel, the good news, that it's a free gift that comes to us that we receive by faith, and then we are in a position where we're changed, where we're transformed into new creatures, people called your sons and your daughters, with a purpose in this life and an eternity guaranteed before us. We thank you for all this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can have a seat. And kids, you can head for children's ministry. That's for kids up through the fifth grade. Uh, there will be no junior high ministry this week. Uh, that'll kick back in next week. So kids up through fifth grade, under the tent, outside, two and under in the building to the left. Got a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll jump into the message for today. Um, first of all, in terms of announcements, I want to thank everybody who helped out on Christmas Eve. We had, um, I'm told, 2,250 people here Christmas Eve. It was a great celebration. Uh, yeah. Um, down quite a bit still from 2019. We're still working our way back from COVID, but up 50% from uh, 2021. So we're headed in the right direction with that. And it's not about the numbers. It's about the fact that every, every person who showed up has a name. And every person who showed up has an eternal destiny. And a lot of you showed up, and I hope your eternal destiny is sealed through faith in Jesus. But a lot of people who showed up, that's not the case. And it's, a, it's, it's the opportunity for the gospel to be presented. And if nothing else, seeds to be planted that somebody else will water and somebody else harvests you know, down the road. We hope all of those things happen. Uh, so thank you if you played a part in that. If you're on staff, man, our staff did an amazing job, the tech people. They set it all up, then they broke it all down, and then they've been trying to put it back together here all week long. Uh, if you're outside and you're having any trouble with a TV screen, just give them grace for a little while because this has been a tough deal putting stuff back together, but it's, it's all worth it. Thank you if you volunteered. Had a ton of volunteers who jumped in to help make it happen. So again, appreciate that so very much. Um, next week, we'll begin our sign-ups for the Alpha courses at both the Lee Drive and Pine Trees and for the small groups. We've got about 35 to 40 that'll be kicking off in January. More information on all of those groups next week and opportunities to sign up for them. And the Israel trip is still on. It is a departure, April 16th, lasts for 11 days. There's still time to get in on it. My wife finally got her passport situation straightened out, so she and I are going, and we're so happy to be a part of that Israel trip this time around. Um, sign up is outside. Got a cap of 40. We've still got about 12 spots available if anybody wants to go. Chuck and Mary Green are, are heading um, that, that up. And then last but not least, Ken Van Bergen is going to be preaching tonight at 6 o'clock. He's picking back up with his series on the epistles of the Apostle Paul. So let's pray again. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the new year. Thank you for the old year past. Thank you that we can put it behind us and move into what's in front of us. I ask for every one of us that we have that ability to let go of the things of the past, to be able to learn from them, but to move in now, both feet, into 2023, and to be looking for the opportunities that you've got for us, to be understanding the directions you've got for us, and to be proceeding into this year while, on the one hand, knowing that there are no established paths because we haven't been there before, we know that you're there, that you've gone before us, that you're around every corner, and that you know what's in front of us and you're ready to help us do it. We just ask today, Holy Spirit, for you to make the adjustments that need to be made in our hearts and our minds as we get ready to step into all that you have. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, I saw a great quote this week on the cap of my nephew, one of my nephews, and um, it's really the, the thing that got me going on what we're going to talk about today. The, the quote was really very simple. He had a cap. The back side of the cap said, life is hard. The front side of the cap said, it's even harder when you're stupid. And <laughs> I, I, I looked at that. It's one of those you know, things where I'm looking at it going, there's something to that. There really is something to that. And I'm thinking back in the moment over 2022 for me. And yeah, there were some hard spots. And yes, there were some even harder spots when I was stupid. And I suspect the same is true for you. It's one of these things that, that I, I got to the point with where I wrote down in my journal, wrote down in my journal, that I want to let 2023 be the year of not being stupid. Let's declare it. Let's declare that 2023 is going to be the year of, of not being stupid. Now, what we need to understand is that it goes further than that, of course. It means that it needs to be the year where we really believe we need to get wisdom, where we really understand that we need more wisdom. And the question for you may be, well, how? And I'd suggest that's by making sure we have and we keep in place what may be the most important thing we need to be holding on to in walking out this salvation that we've been given. And I'm suggesting to you this morning, maybe the most important thing for you to hold on to this year, to walk out the salvation, the purpose that God has for you is this, the fear of God, the fear of God. Now, some people balk at that. They get real uncomfortable when we start talking about the fear of God and, and don't think that that's something where a lot of emphasis needs to be placed. But, but here's the thing. If you don't have the fear of God in your life, it really means that you're a God. And if I'm running the show, there's going to be a lot of trouble. I know in my life I have everything to fear. But if Jesus is running the show, I have nothing to fear. The good news with having the fear of God in your life is what we see from Scripture is that when we have the right perspective on what the fear of God is, and we have the fear of God, every other fear has been cast out. We have nothing else to fear if we've got this right concept of the fear of God in place. I'd suggest to you that the fear of God is actually a description of how we're supposed to do life as a follower of Jesus. It's a description of how we do life as one who is a disciple of Jesus. Let's look at a few verses. Let's start with New Testament verses. See, some people, you go, well, I know the Old Testament talks a lot about fearing God, but, but we're under a new covenant. I mean, we just took communion for goodness sakes, and we talked about the love of God. We talked about the acceptance of God. We talked about the fact that Jesus did it all, and my performance doesn't earn me my salvation. And I stand by that 100%. But let's not create a dumb dichotomy where we go, well, if that's true, then the fear of God is not true. No, both are true. Both are supposed to be held in place. You and I are loved completely by the Father, by grace through faith in Jesus. You are a son or a daughter as a gift that comes by faith in Jesus. We are in a place where God will never reject us because of the completed work of Jesus on the cross. But there is at the same time a fear that comes into play with God. See, the idea is, is that we have, 1 John 4.18 says, no fear of punishment where there's perfect love. And we have the perfect love of the Father. And so there's no fear of punishment. We aren't going to go to hell. We are not going to have that, that punishment that Jesus took on the cross. But just get the big picture and think, think rationally, logically, normally about this, there's still a fear that comes in for one who has the ultimate authority in life. As a parent, you've got kids, right? If you are a parent, you have kids. You're not a parent if you don't have kids, right? So the, the idea is, with your kids, hopefully you love them. Hopefully they know that you love them. And hopefully there is a kind of fear of the father and mother that is in place with the child in terms of how the parent administers instruction for the child. That is, you 
obey because you don't want the consequences of discipline to come down. Hebrews chapter 12 says that our Father who loves us, our Father who has accepted us, our Father who will never reject us, still disciplines us. And in fact, it says in Hebrews chapter 12 that part of the proof, part of the proof that you're actually a son or a daughter of God is that you've got a Father who disciplines you. He cares enough about you to discipline you. And discipline is something that is not always pleasant. One of my, well, several of my grandkids stayed with us over Christmas. Their parents were with us too. There was more than one occasion where three-year-old got out of line and the father gave him the motion that consequences were about to follow. The kid didn't want the consequences. I'm not going to name them because I don't want to out the, the ones that got the discipline, but but. The discipline was not desired, but once administered, the discipline also did not raise a question about the love of the father for the child who was disciplined. If rightly handled, that's the way it works between parents and children, and with a perfect father, that's certainly the way it's supposed to work with us as we get the right idea of this. Now, again, fear of God is a description of how life should be done. It starts off with the very hard instruction of Jesus in the New Testament. Let's look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Because we have Jesus saying fear God, we have Paul saying fear God, we have Peter saying fear God in different contexts. Jesus said this, Do not fear those who kill the body, that is people, any people. Don't fear them. Because they're unable to kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, what's that all about? Well, that's about the hard news here. And and please, if you're in this category, stick with us all the way through this morning. That's about the hard news that if you don't know Jesus, you've got every reason to have a true fear. A true fear of God. Not just of of the discipline of a father who loves you, but rather, you've got a real fear of punishment that, that Jesus himself is saying needs to, be, needs to be in place. Now, that's for the ones who aren't sons and daughters. Now, switch. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. You've got Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, saying to Peter, tell people this. Tell people this. If you address us, Father, that is, if you believe you're a son or a daughter and call God your Father... If you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, then conduct yourself, how? In fear during the time of your stay on earth. And then one more that you're probably familiar with already, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, the apostle Paul, God saying, Paul, tell him again. Peter's told him, you tell him too. This is what we need to be thinking. This is how we need to see life. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation. How? With fear and trembling. It's how God says we do life as a follower, with fear and trembling. Does this mean that we're scared of God? No. It means that there's a fear of moving out from under the protection of his covering. It means that we believe, we have faith that God's ways are higher than our ways. We have a faith that God gives us instruction on how to live life out that's going to be the, bring the, the best life possible. And in that faith, we walk in his ways and we understand that we don't know enough to make life better without his instruction. And so there's a fear that we're going to step off into our own speculation about how life should work instead of staying in the middle of his revelation about how life actually works. It's a fear of getting off into the unknown territories where God has not given any any promises of of protection. The fear of God, and you know this probably, is the way of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of how real wisdom comes. Wisdom is how to do life the best way possible. That's one definition. How to do life, how to live life the best way possible. Let's look at just a few verses on that. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise it, despise wisdom and instruction. Um, Proverbs 9, 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge 
of the Holy One is understanding. And then last one, Proverbs 16, 6. By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one does what? Keeps away from evil. It's the fear of the Lord that brings understanding. It's the fear of the Lord that brings wisdom. It's the fear of the Lord that keeps us away from evil. Now, these are three verses out of 11 that talk about the fear of the Lord bringing wisdom just in the book of Proverbs. It's so, something that, that God talks about again and again and again. And, and what happens when we don't do that? We get stupid. We get stupid. That's what it boils down to. I mean, that's why I'm saying I want 2023 to the year, the year of not being stupid. I want to understand that that I need to have a fear of God that stays in place, that releases the wisdom of God, that keeps me on the path of God. I mean, think about it from a big picture point of view. This is a lot easier to do. Get yourself out of the picture for just a moment and think about all of those stupid people out there, okay? Think about the stupid things that you see coming down in politics. Think about the stupid things you see coming down in the educational system. Think about the stupid things you see in media, What's going on? Why, why, why are decisions being made as decisions are being made? Because there is no fear of God. Because there's no fear of God, the ways of God are not being looked to as the instruction for how to do things. And rather, speculation that comes from whatever means they're drawing from is then what rules in people's lives and rules in a country and rules in a community. Speculation rather than revelation. And again, it's because there's no fear of God that comes into play. Now, everybody gets on the the bandwagon with that, whether you're Democrat, Republican, whatever your views are on whatever, you think that they are really being stupid. But the, the real gist of this, the real focus point for us, needs to be not them but me. It needs to be, where am I being stupid? It needs to be, it needs to be about where am I going to change and where am I going to be watching out for for the stupid that keeps me from the fear that blocks the way to the wisdom that God wants me walking out. The good news is, in addition to the warnings, there are promises that come in with this, this fear of God and the wisdom that follows. Let's take a look at Psalm 31, Psalm 31, 19, where David says, How great is your goodness, God, how great is your goodness which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. I mean, I like that picture, that God has goodness stored up for me, goodness stored up for me that he's ready to release as I fear him. You go, well, that sounds like what? So you got to get in front of him and say, God, I'm so afraid of you, so release your goodness? No, it's the idea that God has goodness stored up for me as in a fear of him, I walk in his wisdom and his ways, and blessings follow. It's really that simple. Does that mean a perfect life? Does that mean a life without crisis? Does that mean a life without trouble? No, that's going to come. But it does mean the best possible life in the midst of crises and troubles and trials that will come in as we we stay on the path that he's got with the wisdom that he's provided that only comes as there is a fear of God in place, a fear of God that, that basically knows our propensity to lapse into our own speculation, to abandon his revelation, to, to step out from under the protection that, that he's going to provide as we do stay on the path that he's, given, that he's given us. So is there a clear definition that we can come up with? I mean, so often, so often you'll hear the definition uh, for the fear of God being that's reverence and awe. Reverence and awe. And that's good. We are to revere and to stand in awe of God. But if that's all that you have in your definition of the fear of God, you and I fall woefully short in what it really means. To have reverence and awe can be just standing in slack-jawed amazement at how big something is or someone is. And that's not enough. It's got to be an amazement that brings action. It's got to be an amazement and awe that provokes motivation in terms of, of how we live life. And, and that's what I, I think the, the fear of God really is. It's, it's this idea that we are going to be people who understand that the fear of God is about, about attitude and action. It's about submission and obedience. Don't get the two confused. 
Submission and obedience are two separate things. Submission is the attitude that we have towards God or towards anyone in authority. Anyone that God has put in authority. I mean, we're in an era now where nobody likes the word submit. Submit. Nobody does. I, I had a conversation with somebody this past week, and they were explaining how, well, Gen Z people, Gen Z people don't like the word submit. Adam and Eve didn't like the word submit. I mean, it's nothing new. You can't attribute it to your generation. It is something that's innately in the fallen nature that we have. Submit to God and, this is where it gets tougher, submit to the authority structures that God puts in place. That's where the rubber meets the road. It's kind of like loving people is how we prove we love God. Submitting to the people God puts in authority is how we prove we're submitting to God in many instances. And in addition to that attitude of submission, there needs to be the action of obedience. Now, let's just qualify that a second here so nobody gets off on the wrong idea. We're to have an attitude of submission to all godly authority. We don't necessarily obey all godly authority because godly authority may come up with some ungodly things that we're told to do, and you don't do them, but you still have the attitude even though the actions don't follow. I know that seems incongruous, but that's the way it works. With God, though, it is a complete, utter submission that comes into play and the action of obedience that follows from that, doing what God says to do. Uh, John Piper, he's kind of a famous theologian preacher, said one time that the fear of the Lord produces the greatest possible life anyone can live. There is no better life than the one lived in the will of the Lord. Fearing God, in connection with that, means that God is, in your mind and heart, so powerful and so holy and awesome that you would not dare run away from him, but only run to him. Again, that's another picture of the protection aspect that we're talking about. That, that the, the fear of God that we have is, again, that fear of moving out from under his protection. And when we do, when we have, when we discover that we're out of there, what do we do? We run back to him, not run further away from him. What happens to us so many times, though? When we get off the path that God has, when we make a mistake, when we move into sin, and then we see the consequences flowing, too many times we get stupider and stupider, and we run further and further away from where he wants us to be instead of running back to the protection that he has to provide for us. It's, it's how it's supposed to, to work out. The fear of God is going to look like this submission and obedience in particular where we obey God instantly where we obey God even when it doesn't make sense to us. See, we, we, when you, when I, gave our lives to Jesus, we gave up, we surrendered the right to have our own opinions about almost anything. Now, take that with a grain of salt, I know. But we surrendered our right to argue with God about what he says is right and true and what he says is the way that things need to go. We gave it up. We've got no right to say, I don't like that God. And obedience, the fear of God, the wisdom that comes from it, is one that's shown where we obey God even when it doesn't make sense to us. We obey God even when it hurts. We obey God, we obey God without gauging the popularity of our obedience in today's culture. I mean, this is, this is part of what can become difficult, and sometimes it's not something we even see. As we s slowly go through this, this process, again, like a frog boiling in water, where we adopt cultural values that are put upon us because of the, the magnitude or the, the number of the majority opinion that's coming against what we believe the revelation of God says. And as we, we have all of these voices around us speaking in, we, we give in. We give in. We've got more of a fear of being out of line with what everybody else is thinking or saying than we do with being in line with what God says or thinks. Now, this is tough. This is a very tough area because on the one hand, we need to have a humility and a teachability to, to recognize that we may be the ones that have it all wrong and we're in the minority because we're wrong and everybody else gets it and we don't. So we need to sometimes listen. In fact, we need to all the time listen. But, but again, not be carried by the opinions that come in. I mean, you can think of all sorts of areas where this comes in. I mean, as you look at the Bible, as you look at what God says the right way to live is. In my opinion, in my reading of Scripture, 
God says that, that marriage is between one man and one woman. Now, other views come into play. Other views come into play to accommodate other perspectives. And as that happens, what are we supposed to do? Well, it's not like we come in with a sledgehammer and start bashing everybody that disagree with us, but we also hold firm in, in the proposition that we believe to be true and right before God. I mean, I'll give you a, a, an inconsequential, not to me, it's not, but to you this is going to seem inconsequential, uh, example. Um, I get a lot of questions from new people who come in on how we have Living Sense Church set up. How's the government set up of the church? What does that look like? And I tell people we run by an eldership. And the frequent question that follows up, and there's a reason for this, is who can be an elder? And well, you can be an elder if you're a follower of Jesus and look at Titus and Timothy and they'll tell you the, con- the, 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 um, the um, qualification for an elder and the, the ones who are looking to pick a fight, they'll say, well, tell me more. Because they're looking for this particular issue and the issue is gender. Can women be elders at Livingstone's Church? And the answer is no, no. Only males can be elders here. Does that mean that women are less than? No, it has nothing to do with that. Does that mean that women can't teach, that women can't operate in all sorts of giftings? No, but, but for me, for us, at least, I, I see the Bible is saying it's a male eldership. Now, I could be wrong. There could come a point in time, I suppose, when somebody could point something out to me that causes me to say, whoa, I missed it completely. I'm sorry. And I hope I have the humility to say that. But in the meantime, this is the point I'm getting to. In the meantime, I have a fear of God that this is the right way, even though I may be wrong. I have a fear of God that says this is the right way, and I'm willing to let half of the people leave who think that is not the right way, okay? Again, inconsequential for most of you, I know, but the idea is it applies for every one of us in different areas of life. There are going to be those questions where you're going to have to make decisions on whether you're going to operate with a fear of God, even though it means the severing of some relationships. You're going to have to operate with a fear of God, even though it means some people call you the names that they will call you when you don't agree with what they think what they say, what they believe is the right way. And we're talking about people with sincere beliefs in both directions. Well, what ought to trump all of that is the fear of God that says that unity is one of the highest values, that we need to be able to disagree on things and still agree together that we love each other in the name of Jesus for the, the, the purpose of, of, of extending the kingdom. Okay, getting off on a tangent there, but the idea is, again, we want to see what it means to fear God, to walk according to his purposes, to walk in wisdom. Now, it's not just with um, um, threats of, disciple, uh, of discipline that come in, but also promises of good things. Let's look at Psalm 25. Psalm 25, verses 12 and 14. We've got, there are some promises that come in. Psalm 25, 12 and 14. Who is the man who fears the Lord? God says, The man who fears the Lord is the one that God will instruct in the way that he should choose. Verse 14, I love this verse. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. I mean, this is talking about a degree of intimacy with God and a degree, a level of revelation that comes from God that is explicitly for those who fear him. Not just for every son or daughter, But for those who fear him, he'll make them know his covenant. He'll make them know the intimacy of relationship that comes where apparently secrets are are, are shared. And it's a year then as we move ahead that we need to take care with the revelations that God makes in Scripture. The revelations that he makes about the way to walk, the revelations that he makes about fear fearing him, the revelations that he makes about the need to walk in wisdom, and not let our rationalizations annul God's revelations. It happens too often. We come in with various rationalizations that that we'll argue are scripturally based to annul the revelations that God has made. This is a matter for us of, of letting go of all of those and moving ahead, moving ahead to to let God help us make the decisions that in our own minds we, we can't see as right. Now, some, some are going to say, well, but, but God 
has led me into some bad decisions. I've had people tell me that before. God told me, and it did not turn out well. Okay, God didn't lead you ever into any bad decisions. Never happened. Never happened. You need to own it was your bad decision. God is notoriously not stupid. The Bible says that. And so he's never going to lead you into a bad decision. You come up with your own bad decisions, and you can say you heard God on it, but you were hearing something else other than God in, in the process of it. I mean, it's a, it's a matter, again, of just growing in wisdom. Four types of people I was reading this week. Four types of people when it comes to wisdom. Number one, you've got the simple that are too young and lack the experience to have wisdom. Because wisdom doesn't simply come by what we know up here. It comes by applying what we know up here. And you've got to have some time to apply what you know up here in order to find out how things work out. Number two, second category, they're called fools. That is, they know better but still choose to act unwisely anyway. Doesn't make sense, but that's why they're called fools. Number three are mockers. Mockers who go a step further. That is, they actually despise wisdom. They despise wisdom, and they despise those who seek to follow wisdom. And then finally, number four, there are the wise. Those that, number one, fear God and are teachable, and they actually act on the wisdom that they receive from God. Billy Graham said one time that knowledge is horizontal, but wisdom is vertical. It's what comes down from above. What else? What else does the fear of God look like in 2023? Should it look like in 2023? Well, another thing it should look like is the idea of priorities and how we set priorities in life. Um, you've probably seen the illustration before of big rocks and little rocks. You get a container, and you have a bunch of little pebbles, and then you have some big, big rocks. And the challenge is to fill the container. And you're told you can put all of these rocks in the container. They will fit. And you start off by putting all the little rocks in the container, and then you try to put the big rocks in, and they don't fit. You reverse the order, and you put the big rocks in first, and it looks like it's almost full, but then you put the little rocks in, and it fills it up, and all of it fits in. The little rocks represent the inconsequential things in life. The little rocks represent um, time on Facebook. The little rocks represent time with your, your favorite TV program. The little rocks represent, you know, go on and think of whatever you think, what you know are the inconsequential things in life. The big rocks, what does that represent? It represents your time with God. It represents your time with your family. It represents your, your job. It represents the friends that you have. The idea is part of the fear of God is recognizing what first things first are supposed to look like. The, the, the recognition that, that, that the priorities that we set in place determine the capacities, that the sequence in which we do things determine the capacities that we have in life. If you get up in the morning and you jump into the inconsequential, you're going to find that you don't have time for the consequential. If you get up in the morning and begin with a consequential, you'll find that everything else is going to fit in around it. And that's just because God has said, put first things first. Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things are going to fit into your container. It's, it's a matter, again, of adopting his wisdom in, instead of ours. <sighs> Wisdom in 2023 that begins with fear needs to begin to be seen by us as, as a verb and not just more information that we get. Some of the temptations I jotted down that I want to watch out for this year, temptations to be stupid this year. Number one, conform to the voices around me to do other than the things that God has clearly commanded. Number two, the temptation to be stupid this year is going to be where I'm tempted to follow my feelings, where I just have a gut feeling on something, and I choose to follow that when God's got clear direction on it. You, you, you've heard it before. The advice to follow your heart is the worst advice in the history of advice. It's, it's ignoring the idea that, that we're told our heart is deceitful, our human heart at least is deceitful, above all things. Number three, the temptation to be stupid this year is going to be failing simply to seek God's wisdom through his word. It's going to be that temptation to say, I've read the Bible. It's going to be that temptation to say, you know, I can just look at that little daily light magazine out there and I can get everything I need to get. It's the temptation to not understand that we do need to dive into his word. 
it needs to be a discipline that we choose to jump into to know what the revelations are that he made to, to replace the speculations that we're, we're tempted to, to walk in. The temptation to be stupid this year is going to be the failure to seek change and, and to grow. You know, sometimes I go through seasons of life, and I, I imagine you do too, where it seems like everything's in order. Everything seems to be going okay. And I'm just enjoying the favor of God. I'm enjoying the feeling of intimacy with God. And that's good. That's good. But, but those are the times, too, when I know by experience that I need to be asking God to show me where I need to be changing, what I need to be looking at, what I need to be watching out for. Because, because what happens? Well, crises are going to come. When the crises hits, we always say, God, help me. God, what do I do? God, how do I need to change? And we cannot avoid all crises, but we can avoid some and we can lessen the degree of seriousness with many by being prepared in advance by changing before crises come to be ready for the situation when it arises. Does that make sense? It's the idea of knowing that that life's going to work this way. It's the idea of being ready to change in areas that aren't at present a crisis because all of life is connected. Some of you maybe right now are having a financial crisis at the end of the year. And you're laying things before God, and you're saying, what do I do, God? And you're making decisions on how to handle your money, how to get out of debt, how to invest better, how to tithe. All of these things are coming into play. But then in the midst of it, your marriage is falling apart. And you're going, what's going on? I'm obeying you in this area, God. But, but what's happening? Your marriage is falling apart, and then your finances are affected. And even though you're doing what God has said in your finances, it's not going the way it's supposed to go. And that's because you don't have compartments in life that stay isolated from the other compartments. It all flows together. It all flows together. You can't just say, I'm going to be good in this area, but I'm going to do my own thing in this area, and think that the two aren't going to affect each other. It's going to affect every other area of life when we're choosing, again, to ignore the revelation of God, when we're choosing to have a fear of God in one area, but not in another, and walk out life that way. It's the idea that we want to know John 4, 18, 1 John 4, 18, that the perfect love of God does cast out all fear. The perfect love of God casts out all ungodly fear. Bill Johnson said one time, Bill Johnson from Bethel Church said, all godly fear is wisdom. All ungodly fear masquerade, masquerades as wisdom. It, it's the idea, again, that 1 John 4, 18 is talking about ungodly fear about the perfect love of God casting out all ungodly fear, about the perfect love of God casting out all fear of punishment that comes from a follower, but not casting out this matter of, of the fear that needs to come in of keeping our life on track. Nehemiah 11.1 1 says, delight, delight in fearing the name of God. Ponder that this week. How? How is it that you can delight in, in actually fearing the name of, of God? Winding it up real quickly, wisdom is the ability, again, to make good decisions. Wisdom is something that begins with the fear of God. Wisdom, it says in James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8, is something that we ask for and God promises to enable us to have it, to make decisions if. If what? If we develop the know to enable the know-how. The know is the revelation of God. Wisdom is the know-how. If we acknowledge the basic idea that his ways and wisdom are as high above mine as his power is. He's got omnipotent power, and most people would tend to agree with that, but sometimes we tend to think that that omnipotent power is coupled with a brain that's no bigger than, than our brain is, and that's, that's ridiculous. It's understanding that his omnipotent wisdom goes beyond that. And if... We keep on listening. The fear of God, the wisdom that comes from it, is not something that's given once and stays in place as it is forever. It's something that is built upon over time, and it means we need to keep listening. Think Abraham and Isaac. God spoke. God said, give me your son Isaac on the altar. Abraham listened. Wonder if Abraham had quit listening as soon as God said, kill your son on the altar. Not a good ending for Isaac or for Abraham, for that matter. Abraham kept listening. And God said, no, you actually don't have to kill him. I'm going to provide a sacrifice that's different from Isaac. As we enter 2023, let's keep on listening. Let's 
look for the revelation that God has for us. Let's commit to a fear of God that's going to begin to un- uncover fresh wisdom of God for us. Let's just make that, that resolution that we're going to let 2023 be truly the year of not being stupid. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the provision you've made for us, for the place you've given us here in your kingdom to do the work of your kingdom in Kona and through the islands of Hawaii. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to equip us for the unique purposes you've got in this coming year, whatever this year may hold. We confess that we don't know what it's going to look like, but we confess that you do know now what's around every corner. And Father, we, we want to learn what it means to fear you, to operate in the wisdom that you give through your revelation, to be people who make the choice, put your ways above ours, and to just give up being stupid. We ask for your blessings upon us now, Father. Your voice to come through your word, through dreams and visions in the night, through prophetic utterance, through whatever means you choose to speak.